Um, good morning, everyone. I am delighted to be here. It's good to see so many folks on the call. Um, my name is Dr. Laura Tully. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist and associate professor in psychiatry at the UC Davis um, Med Center, specifically our early psychosis program. And I'm here today to talk to you about understanding psychosis, specifically, you know, what is psychosis, symptoms, the etiology, the course, and how we might treat it. I know that um, your group are working hard to implement um, additional services for folks in the early phases of psychosis. And the goal of today's discussion is to provide everybody with some sort of foundational knowledge. So some of what I'm going to be talking about today, you'll already know, and some of it may be new. Um, and that may be different for each of you, depending on where you at, where you're at in your career, your familiarity, etc. I do have the chat open to me on a second screen. Uh, and so if you have questions as we go along, please, you can put that question in the chat and I will do my very best to answer it as we go. And if I'm not able to do that, I'll pause at the end and we'll review all of the questions. You'll see me looking to a different camera as I monitor that. So I apologize that I'm not necessarily maintaining eye contact with everybody throughout the whole presentation, but uh, rest assured, I'm paying attention to all of the things that you need me to pay attention to. OK, so let's get started. Uh, first, I just want to um, declare my conflicts of interest. I work in digital mental health, so developing applications to support treatment of young people experiencing psychosis and beyond. And as such, I have ownership shares in a digital mental health company called Safari Health Inc. And I am a consultant for a digital therapeutic company called Chatow Inc. Um, none of the content that I'm talking about today overlaps with these interests, but it's important that I let you know. So today, these are the four things that I'm going to spend time talking to you about. First, we're going to cover what is psychosis, so symptoms, clinical features, epidemiology. Then we're going to talk about how psychosis develops, course of illness, the high risk period, prognosis. Then we're going to talk a little bit about what causes psychosis, what's our current understanding. So this is um, what's happening in the brain, what's happening with genes, what's happening with the environment. And we're going to spend some time learning the current best explanatory model that we have, which is the vulnerability stress model. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about treatment options. We'll spend some time talking about the coordinated specialty care model, as well as other evidence based practices, case management and family support. So you know, we're going to be talking together for about two hours today, and I understand that uh, our attention is often pulled in multiple directions when we're attending meetings like this, and that's okay. I have the same problem. And so I just want to orient you to the one thing that I want you to remember from today. If you take just one thing away, this is what I want you to remember. That psychoeducation about psychosis is the very first intervention when you're working with clients and families experiencing psychosis. And the content of this talk reflects the content of the psychoeducation that you can give to clients and families. So if you have folks on your caseload who are experiencing psychosis uh, and you haven't yet had the opportunity to provide them with any education or information about what psychosis is, you can use the content in this presentation to um, provide that education uh, and just refer to these slides, which will be shared um, at the end of today. So why is it that psychoeducation is the um, sort of primary sort of first intervention that I would want you to give for your clients experiencing psychosis? Well, we know from the research that in-depth, accessible and recovery oriented information about diagnoses, symptoms and treatments improves the client's and family's motivation for treatment. It validates the client's experience. It connects their personal experience to the mental health language that you're going to be using in, in your setting. And it creates an understanding of the rationale for the treatment right, that you're offering, which then is going to in, hopefully increase buy in to engage in that treatment. Essentially, knowledge is power. And the second thing that I want you to be thinking about is that psychoeducation forms the foundation of what I call your treatment house. So imagine that when you're working with a client in a sort of therapeutic setting and um, working with them in a treatment setting, uh, you're building them a treatment house that is made of all of the coping skills and interventions that you're providing to them. But the foundation of that house is their understanding, their, psycho their understanding, their information, their knowledge. It forms the foundation of all of your interventions, 
And uh, when you're introducing any new intervention, you're always going to start with psychoed. And what we know about building houses is that is that if the foundation is weak or poorly formed, the house is not going to do well and potentially fall down. The same analogy goes for your treatment house. So if you're noticing that your interventions aren't necessarily hitting the mark or folks aren't engaged, I want you to return to psychoed. Does the client and family understand why we're doing what we're doing and what we're doing and how it relates to their experience? So then you ask this question, well, okay, you, you told me to do psychoed, what, what am I teaching them? And these are the elements. What is psychosis? How does it develop? What causes it? And what are our treatment options? And you'll notice that this is exactly the same as the outline for this talk. So again, the first thing that I want you to remember is from today is that this content is content you can and should deliver to clients and families experiencing psychosis. So with that, hopefully I've provided you the rationale and understanding of why we do psychoed. Let's jump into the content. So we're starting off with what is psychosis, talking about symptoms, clinical features, and epidemiology. So as we think about psychosis, I think the first place to start, particularly for our clients and families, and, and for some of us in the mental health field, depending on our training, there are a lot of common misconceptions. So when we think about what psychosis is or what it might look like for a person to experience it, we might have some ideas like this, right? We might have ideas around it being split personality, right? We think about this misunderstanding of what schizophrenia is. We might have the idea that only males or only men experience schizophrenia. We might have the idea that people with psychosis are violent or dangerous or homeless or that they can't function in society. And from the sort of 60s period, 60s and 70s period, there was also this idea that it was the mom's fault, this idea of the refrigerator mother. Um, these are all pretty common misconceptions, both inside the field and out in the general community. And one of the things that we want to do when working with young people in the early phase of psychosis is sort of provide education that these are misconceptions, that these are not necessarily true. And the reality is that there are plenty of people both um, in regular daily lives and in the public eye who experience psychosis, who are doing well most of the time um, and are good representative individuals who are living a good life and they just happen to have psychosis as part of it. So you'll probably recognize some faces here. These are all individuals who have diagnoses of psychotic disorders at some point in their life. I'll draw your attention to the top right here. This is um, Professor Ellen Sachs. She's a professor at the um, University of Southern California uh, in their legal department. And she does a lot of um, legal research and advocacy around um, conservatorship and the rights of mental health patients and how those are taken away from them. She herself has a diagnosis of schizophrenia and has had that diagnosis since she was in her 20s. And she has both written a book called The Center Cannot Hold and done a TED talk about her experiences. If you haven't had the opportunity to either watch that TED talk or read her book, I highly recommend it. She's, she talks very eloquently about her experience. Um, and then some other faces on here too, we've got Catherine Zeta-Jones, who has a diagnosis of bipolar disorder and experiences psychotic features during her mood episodes. We've got John Nash here, who had a diagnosis of schizophrenia. He was a um, Nobel Prize winning economist um, who experienced auditory hallucinations throughout his life. Uh, Kanye West, or Ye, as he's currently going by, um, has some, had some very public psychotic symptoms, although he has not necessarily spoken openly about them, um, but clearly is a very successful musician. Amanda Bynes has talked a lot about her interactions with substance use and psychosis um, and uh, has talked very openly about her rehab journey as well. So knowing that we have these folks in the public eye, folks who are successful, let's talk a little bit about what psychosis is and how we can break it down into the symptom categories. So there are kind of four main areas that we'll see symptoms or um, impairments for folks experiencing psychosis. We've got our positive symptoms, negative symptoms, cognitive symptoms, and then the functional impairments that come along with those. 
let's talk a little bit about the positive symptoms. So positive symptoms doesn't mean that they're really, really good. I want you to think about this as a plus sign, almost like a mathematical operator. They are exaggerations in normal human experiences or additions to our normal human experiences. So hallucinations are additional sensory experiences in the absence of sensory stimulation. And delusions or unusual thoughts are um, exaggerations of thought patterns that are outside of culturally accepted norms. Negative symptoms then, if we think about the mathematical operator, are a loss or withdrawal of qualities that tend to make us emotionally connected and motivated human beings. So it's a loss of things like interest, anhedonia, a lack or loss of motivation, also known as abolition, um, a reduced or lack of expression of emotion, also known as flat affect, and then reduced speech production, also known as poverty of speech or eulogia. Um, and these are um, some of the harder symptoms to address because our current medications don't address them um, at this time. Actually, I just want to go back and talk a little bit about abolition and anhedonia. Um, when we think about abolition, I want you to think about um, this sort of get up and go power that we have as humans. So uh, I would imagine that many of us on this call have had days when we've woken up and we've thought to ourselves, gosh, I just don't want to go to work today. And in that moment, we have to motivate ourselves. We have to get out of bed, we have to start our routine, and we have to go to work. And most of us will do that most of the time. And there is a system in our brain that helps us do that, and it's a bit like a jump start. And part of it is that we're able to um, envision the future of, of why we would do a certain thing. What's our motivation for getting something done? What's our motivation for getting up and doing it? And for folks with psychosis who are experiencing abolition, that system just isn't working. Even if they wanted to get up and go and do the thing, the, they're not able to motivate to do it. So they have this thought, I don't want to go and do these pieces, and I'm not able to motivate. Um, and then related to that is anhedonia, which is a loss, of, a loss of pleasure or interest in things that you usually enjoy. What's interesting about anhedonia is that there's something called the anhedonia paradox. So when you ask folks with schizophrenia if they're going to, how much they're going to enjoy a future activity, perhaps you ask them, you know, if you go to the movies next week, rate from one to 10 how much you're going to enjoy it. Compared to folks without a diagnosis of schizophrenia, people with schizophrenia who are experiencing anhedonia will tend to rate their future pleasure lower. Um, but if, they, if you ask the individual with schizophrenia who's experiencing anhedonia in the moment when they're at the movies, how much pleasure they're experiencing, they rate that pleasure level at the same as the individual who doesn't have a diagnosis of schizophrenia. So this is this paradox, right? It's the prediction of pleasure versus the actual experience of pleasure. And this relates to the evolution symptom when we think about brain systems, because it is a similar brain system that is uh, enabling us to envision how rewarding a certain activity will be. And if it feels like it's going to be rewarding and pleasurable, then we're going to be motivated to go and do that activity. So you can imagine how these two symptoms interact with each other. If we're unable to visualize how rewarding uh, uh, an activity will be or how it contributes to our goals, it's going to be much harder to motivate to do it. And if we're unable to um, visualize how much pleasure or joy we'll get out of doing it, it's unlikely that we're going to chase that activity. And we'll talk a little bit later about how you might address those in treatment. Next are the cognitive symptoms. These ones are less talked about. So I think um, most folks are aware of the positive and the negative symptoms, uh, but the cognitive symptoms, less talked about, less well known, but very important to take into account, especially when you're working with a client in a therapeutic setting. So we know from the research that there are pretty consistent um, deficits in things like attention, learning, memory, and problem solving. And these then impact the individual's ability in school or at work or even to navigate the treatment setting. They might need to go slower in a therapeutic setting or during therapy. Um, and so taking these into account um, can be a really important part of scaffolding them in towards their success and their recovery journey. Um, they tend to be quite stable. They tend to appear before the onset of psychosis um, and they tend not to change over time. Um, that's, there is some change there, but in general, they tend to be um, pretty stable. And mostly they're related to prefrontal brain systems and executive functioning, which we'll talk a little bit about when we get to the causes um, section of today.
So together, the positive symptoms, the negative symptoms, and these cognitive impairments contribute to difficulties in a variety of areas of functioning. So difficulties in school or work, so this is their role functioning, um, difficulties with friends or developing relationships, which we would consider to be social functioning, and the extent of these difficulties or impairments are related to the severity of negative and cognitive symptoms. We also know that functioning prior to the onset of psychosis symptoms tends to predict long-term outcome. So if folks were doing better prior to the onset, they're generally going to do better in the long term. If folks were really struggling even before their psychotic symptoms appeared, they might not do as well. We'll talk a little bit about the epidemiology of psychosis. So it affects both males and females. And you can see that there is a slightly higher male um, rate in males than females. The ratio is 1.4 to 1. Um, this is lower than what most people think about. Um, and there are some reasons for that. I think um, t it tends to be associated with sex differences in the clinical presentation of psychosis uh, that then impacts who gets spotted first and who gets services. So we tend to see symptoms start earlier in males. Um, and we tend to see differences in the kinds of symptoms. So we tend to see more positive symptoms in females, so things like paranoia and auditory hallucinations, whereas we tend to see more negative symptoms and um, occupational impairments in males uh, and social impairments as well. And then we also tend to see more comorbid symptoms in females, specifically uh, depression and anxiety and suicidal ideation and behavior. Um, I will note that there is some limitations to this sex differences research. The research to date has focused on sex assigned at birth rather than gender identity. And we know that um, the way that we interact with the social world, world impacts the way that our brain develops and our gender identity and expression and presentation is going to be part of the way that we interact with the world and how the world responds to us. So there is ongoing work happening that will talk more about gender identity, but in general, these are good uh, rules of thumb when thinking about sex differences. When you think about the sex differences in clinical presentation between uh, men and women, it makes sense that we have tended to see more men in treatment than women, particularly because women tend to have um, better social functioning, so broader, more supportive social networks, um, and, and they tend to have less negative symptoms and less occupational functioning. So it looks like they're doing better, which means they might not get into services um, either as early or as frequently as men who are showing more um, obvious signs of impairment and challenges. Psychotic symptoms occur within many diagnoses. You can see them listed here. So, you know, on the left-hand column, we've got non-affective psychosis. So non-affective means in the absence of mood symptoms um, or primary, the psychotic symptoms are primary, even if there are mood symptoms present. And you can see we've got all of our schizophrenia spectrum diagnoses, as well as delusional disorder, brief psychotic disorder, and what used to be called unspecified psychotic diagnoses and is now in the DSM-5 called other specified schizophrenia spectrum disorder. But we also see psychosis in um, mood disorders like bipolar disorder with psychotic features and depression with psychotic features, as well as an interaction um, between uh, PTSD and trauma related disorders and psychotic symptoms. Uh, when we consider bipolar disorder, about 80 percent of individuals um, who experience manic episodes will also experience psychotic level symptoms within the context of that manic episode. And so if you're working with an individual with bipolar disorder, whether they've experienced psychotic symptoms or not at the time of you working together, it would behoove you to provide some education about this and create some sort of plan just in case during their next episode um, they do experience psychotic symptoms. We also see psychosis in some other um, neurological disorders and psychiatric disorders, including dementias and Alzheimer's, uh, the substance induced psychosis, of course, and then organic um, neurological events like head injuries and seizures. And I've also noted that in borderline personality disorder, there is a core criteria that talks about um, temporary psychotic symptoms in a very specific context of emotion dysregulation and social conflict, uh, resolves very quickly, um, and uh, is usually specifically contained to that episode of dysregulation. <clears throat> But the point here is that psychosis can happen across diagnostic categories. <clears throat> 
The second thing I want to say is that psychotic symptoms are actually quite common when you think about them in the general population. So in the uh, mid 90s, there was a big study called the National Comorbidity Survey where um, researchers did phone interviews with large numbers of people across the US um, about their mental health experiences. And during those phone interviews, one in four individuals, so that's um, 25%, endorsed psychosis screening questions. Um, in other studies that have looked at psychotic-like experiences, one in six individuals have endorsed psychotic-like experiences in the absence of a diagnosis. And um, in studies that looked at um, how people are presenting to primary care settings, one in five individuals, so it's 20%, are presenting for treatment at primary care centers, reporting one or more psychotic symptoms, most commonly auditory hallucinations. So when often one of the misconceptions that we have about psychosis is, is that it's rare, that not a lot of people experience it, but actually these data show us that it's more common than perhaps we thought. However, the diagnosis of psychotic disorders are less common. So official diagnoses of psychotic disorders are found in about one in 50 individuals worldwide, which works out at about 2% of the general population. However, we do know that there are approximately 272 new cases per 100,000 each year. And this is specifically in Medicaid data. And that rate is higher than it is in private insurance data, which tells us something about the social determinants of mental health. So as you... Um, Think about providing services in your catchment area, whether it's a county or a school district, et cetera. Think a little bit about the population in that catchment area, and you can use this as a calculation to determine each year how many new cases of psychotic disorders would you expect to happen in that catchment area, and that can inform how you develop your treatment services. What, what number of resources are you going to need to put towards this so that you can appropriately meet the needs of the population? In general, the average age of onset is about 20, but there is a range there from 15 to 30. Um, I would say that on average in our clinics, we're seeing an average age of kind of 17, um, slightly younger for males, slightly older for females, but it's really happening in that very important developmental process of adolescence. Um, puberty starts, the brain starts changing, and when there are disruptions in that um, neurodevelopmental process for folks who are vulnerable to psychosis, that's when these symptoms and impairments tend to appear. And so as you think about developing your services or adjusting things, it's that age range that you'll want to go, you're going to want to spend time with and do um, screening with. So let's talk a little bit now that we've covered what psychosis is about how psychosis develops. So what's the course of illness? Let's I want us to talk a little bit about this concept of a high risk period and what kind of prognosis can we expect? So the first thing to know is that symptoms will start before diagnosis. And I'm going to orient you to the um, figure that we're looking at on the screen here. Um, so on our horizontal axis here, we're looking at kind of the severity level of the symptom on our, um, sorry, our vertical axis, severity level of the symptom and horizontal axis is time. This is sort of the average um, uh, course of symptoms um, for an individual experiencing psychosis. Our solid black line represents our positive symptoms. So that's our hallucinations, our delusions and thought disorder, which really describes the kind of disorganized communication, disorganized thinking that folks with psychosis can experience um, that might manifest in speech that's difficult to understand. It could be tangential or circumstantial or at its most severe kind of make no sense and be considered what's called word salad. Or it could manifest as people struggling to express themselves and they tend to describe having a lot of thoughts that are confusing and it's hard to get them out in a clear way. Our dotted line here is representative of negative symptoms. So that's our lack of motivation, also known as avolition, our loss of interest in pleasurable activities, also known as anhedonia, our flat affect and our paucity or poverty of speech. So what you can see here, let's focus on our solid black line. This is our positive symptoms, is that prior to the onset of acute psychosis represented by this line here and where the arrow is pointing, we see a steady ramp up. Of, of positive symptoms until we reach a threshold point where the person meets criteria for a psychotic episode. Um, and this ramp up period is what we would consider to be the at risk phase. And it can last anywhere from a week to one or more years. Um, and typically, as I said, will start during adolescence. <clears throat> 
And then over time, after the acute psychotic episode, which can last anywhere from one week to one month or more, we see that over time, the positive symptom severity goes down with little undulations, right? Sometimes we have good weeks, sometimes we have bad weeks, um, but over time, the positive symptoms will remit with treatment. Now I want us to focus back on our negative symptoms. You can see that there is a slower ramping up of the negative symptoms in this at-risk phase, and they don't tend to remit as fast. It can take a lot longer for negative symptoms um, to reduce. Uh, partly this is because we currently don't have medications that directly address it, and partly because they're just very challenging to address. Um, because the way to address them is essentially to do this opposite action. If you have avolition or anhedonia, we want to do the opposite of what we're struggling to do. So if I'm struggling to get out of bed, the treatment is to get out of bed to try to jumpstart that brain system again. And of course, that's really hard to do. Those of you who have worked in this population or perhaps have worked with folks with severe depression will know how difficult this can be, that the treatment that you're offering a person is essentially the thing that their brain is preventing them from doing. And so they need lots of support and it can take time for those symptoms to remit. Um, so the other thing that I wanna point out here is that in the US, um, it tends to take a long time for folks to get an accurate diagnosis and then get appropriate treatment to that diagnosis. So here we sort of estimate it at kind of 18 months and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but this is a long time to wait for accurate treatment. And so one of the things that we're trying to do and why we're here talking together today is to um, decrease that time between the first psychotic episode and um, accurate diagnosis. And this is referred to as the duration of untreated psychosis, DUP. Now, DUP is the strongest predictor of outcome. So the shorter it is, the better a person does. So if we can identify folks earlier on um, in this at-risk phase or right around the acute psychotic episode, probably what we know from the research is that the remission of these symptoms is gonna happen faster and the functional outcomes for those individuals are gonna be better overall. So I wanna talk a little bit more about this at-risk phase because this is where we wanna be um, spending some time in terms of identification and treatment of folks. The at-risk phase essentially represents when early warning signs also can be considered subthreshold symptoms start to appear and they can appear anywhere between one to three years prior to the full psychosis. Um, and it's likely an association with brain maturation that happens during puberty. puberty. And one of the things that I want you to take home from today is that psychotic symptoms exist on a continuum from subthreshold to threshold psychosis. It's not a sort of black and white distinction of not psychotic, psychotic. There is a gradation. There is a spectrum. Um, and early signs tend to present on that spectrum as changes in thoughts, experiences, and behavior and functioning. They might include perceptual abnormalities or unusual beliefs or things that are uncharacteristic behaviors for that individual, but they might not be causing um, a severe impact on behavior and functioning, and they might not be causing a lot of distress. I'm gonna illustrate this um, with uh, a, sort of a particular example. So from here, you can see that symptoms can occur on a continuum ranging from common experiences within cultural norms here on the left, all the way up to what we would term threshold psychosis, something that would qualify for an acute psychotic episode. And then in the center here on your continuum, you have attenuated symptoms or subthreshold psychotic experiences. Now, before I go into my specific example, I'm gonna ask you to think to yourself um, your response to a set of questions. So I want you to think, have you ever wondered or thought that your phone was vibrating in your pocket when it wasn't? That's definitely something that happens to me. Um, have you ever been walking back to your car late at night in a parking lot and just for a split second or two, you've had a concerning thought that maybe you're being followed or watched? That happens to me. It probably happens more in women for women than it does for men. But in general, it happens for all of us at some point in our lives. Um, and then finally, I want you to think about whether you've ever been lying in bed at night, the lights are off and that towel that you have hanging on the back of your door for a very brief second. You it looks like a person standing there and you just kind of have a double take. Congratulations to those of you who have had any of those experiences, you have had a psychotic-like experience. So what does that mean? It means that 
uh, psychotic-like experiences are very common. And what is the distinction between having that and it doesn't meet criteria for an attenuated or threshold psychotic symptom versus having it and it meeting it? And the things that distinguish it are things like how much distress you experience from that, um, you have from that experience, um, how much it interferes with your behavior, um, how often it's happening, um, and whether it starts impacting your ability to do your day-to-day -day activities. So for example, if um, it was became very frequent that you were misperceiving that towel on the back of your door at night, you might, and you might be distressed by it, you might start sleeping with the light on, you might take the towel off the back of the door, um, you might do a lot of checking. And if you start doing those things, you're gonna be moving up um, the continuum to attenuated or sub-threshold psychotic-like experiences. And then the more convincing it gets to you, the more distressing it is, the closer to threshold psychosis you're getting. So let's do another example. So the example here is seeing a ghost, which is quite a common experience for folks. Um, and here in the within cultural norms, uh, the individual has seen a ghost maybe one time, thought that it was a loved one who's recently passed, they felt comforted, it didn't um, result in any change on their behavior and was consistent with their family or cultural beliefs. So here you don't have any distress, it's an experience that isn't happening very often, it's not affecting behavior or functioning, and it's consistent with cultural beliefs. The next example, as we move up the continuum towards attenuated or sub-threshold experiences, you're getting increasing frequency, perhaps weekly now, some distress, it's bothering the person. They're able to question it, um, and maybe it's not having that much effect on their behavior. So perhaps the person is seeing ghosts a few times a month, they're not sure why, they don't think that it's real, but it is making them a little scared or nervous, and perhaps it's a bit hard to fall asleep because it's happening at night, and it's not consistent um, with family's beliefs. Then as you get um, increasing in frequency, perhaps it's moving from weekly to daily, increasing in distress, perhaps it's really starting to seem real, but maybe not fully convinced, um, and it's again starting to affect behavior or impacting functioning. For an individual in this area on the continuum, seeing a ghost could be happening a few times a week. They might start having a theory about what it is, like it could be the dead trying to communicate with them. They might be very scared or maybe view it as a special gift. They might stay awake to see them or try to talk to them. And most importantly, all of this is not consistent with their family or community beliefs. Finally, at threshold psychosis, you're seeing significant distress, high frequency, 100% conviction that it is indeed a real um, sensory experience that's happening, at least some of the time, they're 100% convinced, it's affecting their behavior and it's impairing their functioning. So an example here would be they're seeing ghosts regularly or daily, they're 100% convinced that it's the dead trying to communicate with them, they might feel terrified or they might feel gifted, they could be communicating with the ghost day and night, is likely distracting them at work or at school, their family is concerned, this is not consistent with cultural beliefs and it's really starting to impact this person's life. So you can see here with this example, how depending on things like frequency, distress and conviction, um, that's how we're gonna evaluate where on this continuum a person's experience um, falls. I'm gonna take a moment here just to take a look at the chat. I've seen someone put a comment in there. Uh, let me read through it and see if I can respond to the questions. So my brother sends these photos of his curtains in his home. The sunlight shines through them a certain way at a certain time of day to make images of faces appear. Um, and for him, he has a whole photo album full of them. Yes, thank you for sharing that, Calvin. I think um, this is a really nice example of a psychotic-like experience. And where it falls on the continuum is going to depend on um, how often this is happening for your brother, how distressing it is, um, level of conviction, and whether it's impacting them in their day-to-day -day life. Um, and whether this is something that um, is outside or within cultural norms of your family, of your community, um, spiritual beliefs. Uh, so really, really nice example. Thank, thank you for sharing that. So as you're doing an evaluation on where a person's experiences might land on this continuum, there's some really important issues to consider. So the first thing that's important to consider is developmental norms. So if you're working with children, you need to think about 
this concept of metacognition, which is this idea of thinking about our thinking. This can be particularly hard for young children. And so you may need to be more concrete in your questions and you may need to pay more attention to their effect on behavior. What is the kid doing? What is the kid, uh, how is the kid doing in their functional spaces? Um, and you also wanna check in with collateral, parents, guardians, et cetera. Um, and the other piece is that we need to remember that some behaviors are developmentally normal for younger children, but not adolescents. So if you're working with a younger kid and they're endorsing imaginary friends that they talk to, that would be less concerning than if you're working with a 15 year old who's endorsing imaginary friends that they talk to. This is sort of developmentally outside of the norms within um, kind of mainstream American culture. Um, this leads me to the second most important issue to consider is cultural and familial context of the experience. So the interesting thing about psychosis is that really what distinguishes it from something like the thoughts that we have when we're depressed or the thoughts that we have when we're anxious is that the kinds of thoughts that we have in psychosis are considered outside of cultural norms. Um, and so it's important when you're doing an evaluation to first figure out what are the cultural norms for that individual. If an individual exists in a community where there are beliefs in ghosts by the family or it's part of the religious experience or it's a spiritual experience of how we communicate and relate to our ancestors, we're not necessarily going to interpret that experience as a, as a clinical symptom. And so you want to have that context and then you want to look, OK, how is this experience showing up in that context? Is it consistent with are people worried about them? Is it causing distress or impairment? And go from there in terms of your evaluation. And then finally, it's important to look at environmental factors. So if somebody is experiencing suspiciousness or paranoia, which is a common um, delusional or unusual thought symptom, you want to look at what might be leading to this. Are they, be, are they being bullied at school? Do they live in an unsafe neighborhood? Do they have a history of traumatic events um, that have led them to develop um, sort of pretty classic um, cognitive, negative cognitive thought patterns that are present in PTSD? Um, or are they showing these suspiciousness or paranoid symptoms outside of the context of bullying or the trauma or the unsafe neighborhood? So in general, um, when folks have suspiciousness or paranoia related to something like bullying, they tend to be worried in particular contexts around particular people, but it doesn't necessarily expand to the grocery store. Um, but if you're seeing this suspiciousness or paranoia kind of expand out to multiple settings that are unrelated to um, some of these other um, aspects, then we would potentially be concerned and would want to do further evaluation. So I'm talking a little bit here about evaluation. So how do you ask about symptoms? So for some of you, depending on your training background and when you were trained, you may have been told to ask the following two questions to evaluate psychosis. Do you ever see or hear things that other don't, others don't seem to see or hear? Do you ever think that people are out to get you? Now, both of these questions um, sort of set your client up for wanting to say no, because when somebody asks me if I hallucinate, I now am concerned that if I say yes, I'm going to get in trouble, I might get hospitalized, the doctor might um, make a decision about my treatment that I'm not ready to do. Um, and it just feels unsafe for me to answer this question. Same thing for do you ever think people are out to get you? So more often than not, it's possible that these questions are going to get you false negatives. So some better questions to ask are things like, do you feel like your mind is playing tricks on you? Do you feel like your eyes or ears are playing tricks on you? Are there ever times when you don't feel safe? Um, and all of these questions um, are broad, they're non-threatening, and they can take you in many directions, right? It could lead you to OCD, it could lead you to a trauma history, um, but it'll also pick up on attenuated psychosis if it's there. Whenever you get a positive answer, um, a yes answer to any of these questions, you're going to want to follow up regarding frequency, distress, and effect on behavior and functioning. Because remember, these are the things that are influencing where on that continuum the person's experiences would be considered to be. And it's going to help you in your diagnosis. So let's talk a little bit about course of illness and prognosis. So what we know from the research is that folks with psychotic disorders have very high rates of disability. Upwards of 20% of social security benefits are used to care for individuals with schizophrenia. And that's data from 2010, 
um, published in 2013. I am relatively confident that that number has increased over time, um, but I have yet to see an updated analysis. I, I sort of periodically check for it. We also know that uh, 25 to 50 percent of individuals with schizophrenia will attempt suicide at some point. About five to 10 percent will die by suicide, depending, and the numbers vary there depending on how um, the researchers are classifying um, deaths and where they're getting their information from. But this is a pretty significant, um, uh, it's significantly higher than the general population and than other mental health disorders, including depression. And most importantly, for those of you who are working in early psychosis, the highest risk is during the early phases of the illness. So when you're working with these young folks, I think it's very important to have intentional and explicit um, suicide risk assessments, suicide safety plans, and to be checking in on those um, periodically, regardless of whether the individual is endorsing a prior history of ideational behavior, it would be advisable to have a safety plan no matter what, given the increased risk for these individuals. I think the thing that I want you to hear, despite the fact that we know that there are high rates of disability and that we know that there's high risk, that recovery is actually possible. The treatment that you're going to be doing is not just about controlling symptoms, which is typically done with meds as well as case management and therapy. You're also going to want to focus on things like hope and wellness and independence and citizenship and the pursuit of meaningful goals and roles. Building a life worth living is a phrase that we like to use in our clinic. Um, and the recovery is more likely to happen when family are engaged and support persons are involved in the treatment model. And so the other thing that I want you to remember as you think about supporting your clients in their recovery journey is who else is on their bench, who's in their support network. And if that support network is limited, how can you and your team um, scaffold the individual to building a larger support network? Because we know that that is a strong predictor of outcome. Speaking of predictors of outcome, um, this duration of untreated psychosis, or DUP, that I talked about earlier, is the single best predictor of long-term outcome. So the longer it takes to accurately diagnose a person experiencing psychosis and then get them into the right treatment, the worse they do in the long term. The faster, the better. What's challenging is that the median delay between symptom onset and starting treatment in the USA um, based on a study done in mid-2015, 20, is about 18 months, so a year and a half. Um, this is a pretty sad indictment of our system, and I'll give you some comparisons. So in countries like the UK and Scandinavia and Australia, um, their median delay is um, anywhere between three to six months. So our system is not doing a great job here. And so one of the things that we're, we're trying to work on and why um, uh, states and counties have been funding more early psychosis programs is to try to reduce that DUP because we know that early identification is really key. What do I mean by early? Well, early psychosis is typically in this country referred to the first five years after onset of symptoms. It's considered a critical period during which treatment has the biggest impact. Um, and it's also important to note that during this early psychosis period, we want to focus on maintaining functioning rather than recovering functioning that was lost. Although one can do both depending on the individual and, and where they started from. So now that we've covered what psychosis is and what the prognosis looks like, course and outcome, let's talk a little bit about etiology or what causes psychosis. So the best model that we have right now, based on the research, is the vulnerability stress model. And what the vulnerability stress model says is that the onset of psychotic illness is triggered by an interaction between biological vulnerability and environmental stresses. And biological vulnerability is typically considered to be based on genetic vulnerabilities that then lead to other biological vulnerabilities in a person's neural system. When talking about the vulnerability stress model, we really like to use this image. And I share this image with my clients and families and I explain it in the way I'm about to explain it to you. So first I'm gonna orient you to what we're looking at. So on our horizontal axis here, we have a representation of biological vulnerability from low to high. On our vertical axis right here, we have a representation of environmental stress from low to high. 
And then this red line here is the dividing line between folks who have an absence of symptoms and folks who have a presence of symptoms. What you can see from this um, image is that the combination of where you're at on each um, axis is going to influence um, where you're at on either side of this line. So I'll give you an example. For folks that have high biological vulnerabilities, so this might be individuals with first degree relatives um, who also have psychotic, uh, psychotic illness, um, they're going to be higher up on this um, horizontal axis. And you can see then that it takes less environmental stress to tip them over into the presence of symptoms. For folks who have low biological vulnerability, so maybe they don't have a family history of psychosis, it takes more stress to tip them over into presence of symptoms. Importantly, everybody can tip over into presence of symptoms. It's just the combination of vulnerability and stress that's going to influence how that happens and when that happens. Now, there are two things that I like to say to clients and families as we talk about this. The first thing that I like to say about the vulnerability stress model is that right now, we don't have any control over biological vulnerability. As a parent, you don't have control over which of your genes are passed down. You don't have control over how those genes are um, formulated in the young person or any mutations that happen during development. It's out of your control. We also don't have any way to impact it right now. We don't have treatments for it. There's two bits here that are important. For many parents that I work with, one of the questions they ask me is, is this my fault? Did I do this to my kid? And I like to say here, no, you didn't have control over this. And you don't have a lot of control over environmental stresses. We have some control, but you're not necessarily able to control things like the community that a person um, is raised in. So hopefully by talking about the fact that we don't have control over the biological vulnerability factor, that can take some of, it can provide some relief for um, uh, families who are concerned that this was part, partly their fault. The second thing that I think can give a lot of hope to clients and families is that while we don't have ways of controlling or changing our biological vulnerability at this time, we do have ways of controlling and changing both our exposure to stress and the way that we cope with it. And in treatment, it is this part that we're going to focus on so that we can provide the client and family with skills, knowledge, support in their community to either keep them lower on the stress line or to help them be better able to cope when the stress is high so that we're keeping them over on the side of the absence of symptoms. Finally, the other thing that I like to talk about when showing this image and talking about the vulnerability stress model is talking about things like relapse prevention. So over the course of our life, we're going to experience stress. Stress can happen from sort of negative standpoints, like a stressful life event, could be the ending of an important relationship, could be the loss of a job, could be a traumatic um, stressor. But there's also positive stress. Changing from middle school to high school is a positive stressor. Um, getting a new job, organizing a wedding, these are positive events in our life, typically, that can be stressful. Um, and what we, we know that they're gonna happen we can't remove ourselves from stress, but we can set ourselves up for success to cope for it. And um, potentially there will be times in our life when we tip over to the presence of symptoms, but using our skills can bring us back to the absence of symptoms. And so this image here is a really helpful one for explaining why a young person might be experiencing psychosis and talking about how we're going to use our treatment to get them on to the, the absence of symptoms side of the line. So I talked a lot about biological vulnerability. What is it? Well, broadly, it's related to genes and family history. So we know that there is a 10% increased risk if an individual has a first degree relative with schizophrenia, so a parent or a sibling. However, we also know that it's not 100% about genes, right? So there's a 50% concordance rate in identical twins. That means if you have a group of identical twins, um, with one of them having a diagnosis of schizophrenia, 50% of the time, the other twin will also have a diagnosis of schizophrenia. That tells us that it's not wholly genetic, right? If it was wholly genetic, 100% of the identical twins would both have schizophrenia. And we'll talk a little bit about the environmental stresses in a second. <laughs> 
What happens then is um, the the genes that are conferring biological vulnerability confer that vulnerability through um, disruptions in brain structure and function, particularly in the prefrontal cortex, which is this area of the brain here, kind of just behind your forehead, and the dopamine system. So dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's associated with things like motivation and pleasure, as well as concentration and attention. Um, and we know that in folks with psychotic um, disorder diagnoses, that both of these systems are disrupted. And that's related to some of the genes that we know to be um, disrupted in individuals with um, schizophrenia. So a really common question that I get asked by clients and families is, is there a gene for psychosis? And the simple answer is no. We inherit genetic vulnerability only and development of psychosis is not certain. So there's no single risk gene that leads to 100% certainty that you're going to experience psychosis, unlike other illnesses like Huntington's disease. And there's no genetic test for psychosis. We know that there are multiple genes involved and they give vulnerability through multiple pathways. So genes that might be disrupting brain chemistry, so things like the dopamine system or the serotonin system, as well as genes that disrupt brain structure. How does the brain get built? How does it develop over time? What happens during that key neurodevelopmental period in puberty? as well as genes that disrupt what's called brain plasticity. So brain plasticity is our brain's ability to build new connections, learn new things. So think about when you're learning a new musical instrument. As you get better at that musical instrument, your brain is creating new neural pathways associated with the, the skill of playing that instrument. That's plasticity. And what we know in folks with psychosis, that brain plasticity is disrupted or just not as efficient um, as in folks without a diagnosis of um, psychosis. What we know is that unaffected first degree relatives, so individuals who have a, a first degree relative with psychosis but don't have their own diagnosis, might have some of these disruptions as well, but no symptoms of psychosis, which comes back to this idea that we inherit the vulnerability only and that the development of psychosis is not certain. So we talked about biological vulnerability. Let's talk about types of environmental um, stresses. So we know from the research that there's a lot of prenatal factors that impact neurodevelopment and create um, increased risk for developing psychosis later in life. This includes birth complications, including hypoxia during uh, delivery, as well as malnutrition during um, pregnancy and viral infections during pregnancy like influenza, specifically during the second trimester. All three of these are associated with an increased risk of developing psychosis later on in life, but not certainty. Um, we also know that there are social factors that increase risk for developing psychosis later in life, including adverse social and economic conditions, traumatic life events, um, as well as, um, a, well, I guess that's under the, I was going to say a lack of resources, but that falls under our adverse social and economic conditions. Um, there's also um, more evidence coming out um, from the research in the last few years around um, folks who are in historically excluded communities or marginalized communities. Uh, these folks tend to be um, at higher risk for developing mental health problems in general and at higher risk for developing psychosis later on in life. And this is associated with things like the social determinants of mental health, structural racism, discrimination, implicit bias. These are all pieces that are stressful. And if that stressor is happening on an already vulnerable brain, then you can see how that might then lead to developing psychosis or other mental health problems later in life. We also know that there are some family factors that contribute to increased risk for psychosis, including being in a highly stressful family environment, a family environment where there may be poor communication or hostile communication, or a family environment where there may be um, challenges in problem solving um, and sort of family level executive functioning is probably the best way I can describe it. Finally, we know that there are some pretty strong associations with drug use and increased risk for psychosis with a, a specifically strong association between cannabis use and psychosis onset and severity. So I'm going to take a moment to talk a little bit about cannabis use because it's a very common um, it's very common in our population and something that a lot of us when doing therapeutic work with these clients need to address. So cannabis use is actually very common in individuals experiencing psychosis. They tend to use cannabis at higher rates than the general population. Estimates um, range from 20 to 45 percent of clients with first episode psychosis reporting cannabis use. We know that approximately one in two individuals report use in their lifetime. Um, 
might not necessarily be current, but at some point in their life, and approximately one in four meet criteria for a cannabis use disorder. So it's high, highly prevalent and causing um, impacting functioning and leading to uh, substance use disorders. How does cannabis use impact psychosis? Well, first, it increases the risk for developing psychosis in the first place. So we know that using cannabis before the age of 15 makes you four times more likely to develop psychosis as an adult, regardless of your genetic vulnerability. We also know that using high potency cannabis, and by that I mean cannabis with high THC content, makes you three times more likely to develop psychosis at any age. Then for folks who already have psychosis symptoms, we know that using cannabis can make those symptoms worse. We tend to see increased anxiety, increased paranoia, as well as increased auditory and visual hallucinations, not to mention the um, negative functional and legal impacts that can happen for folks who are using cannabis. We talk a lot about this in California because in California, cannabis is legal and available for recreational use and our youth are using it a lot, they're exposed to it a lot, and we need to be thoughtful about how we're talking about that in treatment. Which leads me to talking about what treatment options are. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the coordinated specialty care model as well as some other options if you're not um, associated with the coordinated specialty care clinic. <clears throat> So in general, when you're working with folks with psychosis and their families, you're going to want to boost protective factors as part of your recovery efforts. This means treating symptoms and not just the psychosis symptoms, right? We want to treat the comorbid ones, anxiety, depression, sleep disturbance, psychosis, trauma. You want to work on maintaining physical health. So working on sleep hygiene, nutrition, adding in physical exercise if it's not there and limiting or eliminating alcohol and drug use. Then we want to uh, work on limiting stress, so perhaps adapting educational, occupational, and family responsibilities. Now, this doesn't mean that the client with psychosis gets out of their household chores or doesn't have to go to school anymore. It means that we're going to adapt how those things are being done and what the expectations are. So maybe folks with psychosis might need a little extra time to get their household chores done. Maybe they need a little um, assistance in their educational setting, could be a 504 plan or an IEP. Perhaps they need some adjustments in their occupational environment to set them up for success. You also want to work on improving coping skills, so coping skills that can help with symptom management, as well as coping skills within the family system, particularly around problem solving. And then finally, increasing social support. And social support can be defined very broadly, doesn't have to be the traditional family unit, can be clinicians, can be clergy or other members of a religious community, extended family, friends, roommates, partners, people that are trusted individuals in the client's life that can be part of their support network as they move through their recovery. In order to boost protective factors, we recommend using evidence-based treatments. And here we sort of split them out into kind of three main categories. Evidence-based treatments that impact kind of the biological or neurological aspects of the illness include medication management as well as substance use management. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that with a specific um, discussion around a harm reduction approach. Psychological and or cognitive interventions include using cognitive behavioral therapy, which is an evidence-based intervention for psychosis as well as cognitive remediation. So this is things like brain games and other kind of tr uh, brain training exercises to help folks with their cognitive symptoms like attention or learning and memory, as well as things like social skills training, um, supported education and employment um, activities, as well as peer and family support. And then finally, you want to work on environment and um, family interventions. So this includes case management and linkage, linkage to additional services that can support the person in their success, um, in using a particular family intervention called multifamily group that came out of um, early psychosis um, researchers and clinicians in Maine, as well as providing family psychoeducation. So you can see here that like involving the family is a really important part of um, successful treatment. So I want to talk a little bit now about the coordinated specialty care model, which is the current um, sort of cutting edge recommended treatment for folks in the early phases of psychosis. It was developed and broadly implemented across the UK, Australia, Scandinavia, and now in the US. It typically includes community outreach and education to increase early identification, as well as a combination of evidence-based treatments for psychosis for both the client, the family, and their support network. <clears throat> 
The focus of the coordinated specialty care model is in the first kind of two to five years of psychosis onset. That range is really a decision that's made by the county or the catchment area and the funding body. Um, and there are some variations of the coordinated specialty care model across the United States, and I've listed them here. So the peer program came out of the group in Maine that I referenced. Uh, the Navigate program came out of the uh, uh, National Institutes of Health RAISE study. Um, On Track New York um, is a program across the state of New York. And I believe that there are some, if not many of you on this call that have been working with OnTrack New York um, to, to uh, implement some of these early psychosis interventions. And then there's the EDAP model, which came out of the UC Davis group that I'm part of. These variations have a lot of overlap. Uh, differences might include the age range that these folks tend to see, whether they're including just individuals who've had a, a psychotic episode already or individuals who are also experiencing attenuated symptoms, and then the kinds of um, family, peer, um, and case management interventions that are included. Uh, but in general, they all wrap the client with multiple services and the family as well. Um, ah. So I just mentioned this. So the US programs tend to differ in the age of clients served. So you can see here on track is 16 to 30, EDAP is 12 to 40, peer is 14 to 40, navigate 15 to 40. This is sort of influenced again by funding and staffing and training. Uh, stages of psychosis are served. So is it both high risk and first episode or is it first episode folks only? And then the specific psychosocial interventions, interventions that are provided. So in the navigate program, they use something called individual individual resiliency training or IRT, which is actually a CBT based intervention versus more um, traditional CBT that's used in EDAPT and PEER. And then there's family education that's happening in Navigate versus multifamily group that's happening in PEER and EDAPT. Uh, this is a visual representation of what the UC Davis EDAPT coordinated specialty care model looks like. It's really just an expansion of the models that have come out of the Navigate and on track New York studies. And I think the most important thing I want you to see here is that we have both the client and the family involved in treatment. Family here defined very broadly and defined by the client doesn't necessarily have to be traditional um, biological nuclear family relatives, could be other support persons, chosen family, roommates, partners, et cetera. But it's whoever it is that's in that person's support network that's going to help them be successful in their recovery journey. The coordinated specialty care part, the coordinated part of the specialty care model is mostly done here through our weekly um, team meeting where everybody on the clinical team gets together and talks about cases and figures out how to move forward to support that client. And you've got multiple different kinds of voices in that discussion so that it's not just coming from the psychiatrist or not just coming from the psychologist. You're getting multiple perspectives and then coming together to work as a team to support that person in their goals. There's a lot of clinic coordination that's happening in the CSC model. You've got referrals, you've got screening, you've got case management happening even before they're in the clinic. We have our physicians providing health and medication management as well as psychoed and support. There's a lead clinician, typically a psychologist or a social worker, who's providing gold standard assessment, psychoed, and trauma integrated CBT for psychosis. We have specialty supported education and employment um, staff who are specifically focused on supporting that client in either getting back to school or adapting their school environment or getting back to employment or um, adapting their employment environment or helping them even move from school to employment and vi vice versa. Um, we have a family advocate. So this is an individual who has lived experience of caring for a loved one experiencing psychosis. And their job is to support the family members. Their job is to be there to talk about how hard it can be, how distressing it can be. Often there are conversations for parents around grieving um, the loss of the life for your child that you thought your child was going to have around the um, negative thoughts that we might have as parents around whether it was my fault that my kid is experiencing this, could I have done something differently? And there is something very powerful about having another family member to talk to about that. It's a perspective that often our clinicians and physicians can't bring into the room. Similarly, we have peer case managers. So peers are individuals with lived experience of uh, mental health symptoms themselves. Uh, we do try to recruit folks who have um, lived experience of psychosis 
um, as well as lived experience of navigating complex mental health systems. And then as the case manager, they work with the client to support linkage to community services. They might also go out into the community and do skills coaching and skills practice. They might attend um, events with them, uh, supporting them and getting out there and doing the things that they want to do. And then finally, we offer a series of groups. We've got multifamily group, we've got substance abuse management group, family support groups, peer support groups, an expressive arts group, as well as a cognitive remediation group. And what we ask our clients and families to do is to pick at least one group to be involved in as part of their treatment. And what's important about the CSC model is that clients and families need to be engaged in all of these aspects. They're not just coming in for weekly therapy. They're not just coming in for monthly visits with their psychiatrist. This is a coordinated model with multiple sources of support. And when clients and families engage in all of these aspects, those are the clients and families that are the most successful in reaching their recovery goals. We're also conducting community outreach and education where we go out into our communities, we teach them about what psychosis looks like, we teach them about this continuum of psychotic symptoms, and we teach them around how can you do screening, how can you refer to our program, and this is all in service of trying to increase community knowledge and reduce stigma of what psychosis is. Our physicians and team are also coordinating with primary care to continue to support physical health. Um, and our lead clinicians are doing a lot of relapse prevention and crisis management as well. So you can see that there's a lot going on. Um, we're also doing outcomes evaluation to see whether our treatment is working and we're adjusting pieces depending on whether what's working, what might not be impacting the person, what's in line with their goals versus what isn't in line with their goals. So, now that we've covered what the coordinated specialty care model is, I want to spend a little bit of time talking specifically about treatment options for folks experiencing psychosis who are using cannabis, since it is such a common um, presentation in our population. So uh, how can the treatment team help? Um, and why am I asking this question? Well, it's important to note that um, we do not exclude people from coordinated specialty care who are using substances. Now, if they have such severe substance use disorder symptoms that they would be incapable of engaging in the coordinated specialty care model, we will first refer them to alcohol or drug services as appropriate. And then when they've got some of that um, substance use under control, they can come back and engage in the CSE model. But for the vast majority of our clients who may have comorbid psychosis and substance use, the substance use is not an exclusion criteria. It's just wrapped in as part of their treatment. And the reason for this is that for folks with psychosis, cannabis use and sometimes other substances is often a method of trying to tolerate distressing symptoms. So, for example, anxiety or hallucinations, and as well as trying to manage emotion dysregulation. So it's sort of a, a maladaptive skill rather than conceptualizing it as an addiction. But the problem, of course, is that cannabis use often has other negative consequences, like increased positive symptoms, as well as legal and physical health consequences. And so the treatment recommendation is to develop what we might call replacement skills that help clients manage their symptoms, tolerate the distress, but they don't have these negative consequences. And additionally, we want to recommend that the treatment team support clients in navigating social situations around cannabis use. Again, in California, this is something that we talk about a lot since um, cannabis use is so prevalent. Our um, young folks in our clinic may, you know, they want to socialize with their friends. There may be cannabis use happening in that social environment. How can we support them in advocating for themselves so that they're not engaging in use? And one example here is that we talk about this allergen story. So they say, like, I'm allergic to it, so I can't use it. And this can basically, this can uh, result in reducing peer pressure to use um, and also prevents them from having to necessarily share their mental health history. We also try to support them in building social networks where maybe use isn't happening either at all or as frequently. But in situ it, again, with this harm reduction approach, you're trying to work with what you've got and um, set the person up for success. Treatment options, so I've mentioned this already, a harm reduction approach is best. We want you to use motivational interviewing techniques to support change strategies. We recommend offering a substance use management group for clients that includes psychoeducation about the impacts of substance use on the brain and our symptoms, that teaches distress tolerance skills for some of those replacement options, and has this harm reduction approach. So, you know, maybe uh, instead of, um, uh, 
talking about abstinence only? Can we reduce use? Can we change the kind of cannabis you're using? Um, if substance use services are outside of the scope of your clinic or your setting, we recommend identifying community partners that you can work with to provide support services. Of course, rural settings are going to look really different from urban settings. You might have different needs. Um, I understand that for folks in your settings, there are also some interactions with um, local Native American tribal needs. So thinking about how can you have those conversations and how can you meet those needs in a way that fits that community. Um, and so really, I want you to discuss the best options for substance use management treatment with your leadership and your team so that you can take some of these suggestions and implement them in a way that fits your setting. I want to just take a little moment to talk about what harm reduction is, just in case folks aren't familiar. It's a set of principles and strategies aimed at reducing the negative consequences of substance use. It's different from an abstinence only approach to substance use treatment, and it recognizes that there are some ways of using drugs that are clearly safer than others. So if your clients aren't willing to think about abstinence at this stage, what are some harm reduction interventions that you can give to at least make them safer? Here are some examples of harm reduction strategies for cannabis use. Number one, can you change the type of cannabis that they're using? Can you change from high THC cannabis products, which are known to have really negative impacts on psychosis symptoms, to low THC cannabis products or predominantly um, um, CBD products? Can you reduce safety risks? Can you identify safe and legal ways of obtaining cannabis to prevent negative consequences like legal or high risk environments? Particularly for some of our younger folks, if they're not able to access substances legally, they might be getting themselves into situations where they could be trafficked, where they could be abused or used in some way that has negative consequences both for themselves and their family and their community. So how can you set them up to be in safer settings? Reducing health risks is another harm reduction strategy. Are there other ways to consume cannabis that reduce the risk of negative health consequences? So can you reduce smoking to reduce cancer risk and other, other issues? And then involving support buddies. So involving support buddies in social situations where substance use will be happening to either reduce use, prevent use, or reduce that impact of peer pressure. So as you can see, none of these are about abstinence, but all of these are um, seeking to create a safer environment for the person while you are simultaneously working on that motivational piece to move the person towards change. I've included some um, distress tolerance skills for substance use that we found our clients really like. These are all taken from DBT. So um, if you're not familiar with these skills, you can look these up. Um, these worksheets are easily Googleable, um, and our clients tend to really like these skills. So there's the tip skill, uh, which includes using skills like um, intense cold temperature, intense exercising, paced breathing, and PMR, uh, doing a pros and cons exercise around changing or staying the same, engaging in radical acceptance. Can I accept reality as it is in order to reduce my suffering? Um, the accept skills is also a really useful skill to identify alternate things to do. The improve skill, another way to um, tolerate distress through imagery, meaning, prayer, one thing in the moment, et cetera. And then self-soothing skills um, through our senses that can help us tolerate distress. So these are, again, all skills that you can look up and there are clear worksheets and instructions for how to teach them. And they're often useful both for substance use and for just tolerating the distress of psychotic symptoms. So with that, um, I've included some useful links for folks who um, uh, are interested in learning more at the variety of about the variety of programs that are available. We've got links about the UC Davis EDAPT program, our on track New York program, Peer and Navigate. I've included some um, uh, links here around from the National Institutes of Mental Health to learn more about what schizophrenia is and what the treatments are. And then there's a link here that can support um, clients and families and yourselves in finding an early psychosis program near you, um, which is um, put out by a particular organization called PEPNET. For those of you that are interested in learning more and aren't already involved in PEPNET, I uh, highly encourage you to join the listserv. Um, there's lots of announcements about specific trainings that go out on PEPNET that are often free and available to the public. Um, there's uh, you can launch questions about referrals to PEPNET and connect with other people um, in your um, uh, community to support your clients.
Thank you for listening. There was a lot of information all at once. We've got a bit, we've got a fair amount of time for questions and discussions. So I shall um, stop sharing my screen and open it up for questions. And you can either unmute or um, put your question in the chat. And I see Tammy put a link in the chat. Hi, Tammy. Welcome. It's good to see you. Hi. Um, so I, I put the link for the first episode psychosis programs in North Dakota. And um, I just wanted to make everyone aware that the slides and a copy and a recording of the webinar will be listed on this website in the near future with Dr. Tully's approval. Um, and so there, there will be um, resources there for you in addition to the slides that she presented today and a copy of the webinar. And yep, so that answers the question, question in the chat. I'm also going to link in the survey for the training. And so this survey will, there'll be one section, which is just a general survey. And then at the bottom of that page, you will click if you're requesting CEUs. There will be another form to fill out for CEUs. And once that's complete and submitted, you will receive that electronically in, in via the email. So I'll put my email in here as well if you do not get that. Um, but in order to get the CEUs, you will have to attend live. So anybody that attends the recordings, there will not be availability of CEUs. So I will put my name and email in the chat for any questions. Is there any and other questions? I want to encourage folks to just take a moment to think about the content that I've um, described today and think what can be helpful for you in your practice now? What is something that you learned today that you didn't know? And maybe share that in the chat if you're willing. Uh, because I think that's a good way to share with your community the things that your brain paid attention to, because each of our brains will pay attention to different things. Mm -hmm. This is Shauna. I'm um, the clinical director at Southeast, and we're one of the pilot regions for the um, first episode psychosis program. So I thank you for doing this. Um, I think one of the things that really stood out to me um, was really I like visuals and so I liked the idea of the threshold and even being able to use that like as a tool for um, you know families to kind of understand like how how this comes about destigmatize it put it into something a little bit more tangible so that was something that I appreciated. Yeah thank you nice to meet you Shona and thank you for sharing that and Tammy I can send you a variety of handouts um, that you can also put up that we use um, to talk with families about what psychosis is. We've got we've got a variety of psychoed handouts that can be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, that would be really helpful. I mean, I can just give a little bit of background um, for the first episode psychosis programs. And if Shauna wants to jump in, she certainly can. Um, we initiated a first episode psychosis program in 2016 at Prairie St. John's in Fargo. Um, and once COVID hit, that was something that was kind of put on the back burner. So we were looking at other options um, to provide this program within the state. And we were very fortunate that Southeast Human Service Center in Fargo and West Central Human Service Center in Bismarck both agreed to become pilots for our program. And we have seen an awesome first year of implementation. So I just need to do a shout out to Shauna and Ari, who are the clinical directors at those centers. But we've we've seen an increase in access to the program. We've hired an outreach and engagement coordinator. Her name is Monica McConkie. She will be going around the state to provide education and information regarding the program. Um, you should be seeing some first episode psychosis brochures going out to the human service centers and in other parts of the community. So I think that, you know, this is something that is really going to be more known moving forward. I mean, we, we're working with Dr. Tully to continue these trainings, which have, I think we have 150 people on, so that's awesome. And so, par pardon me? It's good to see so many people here. I Thank know. you. I know. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we we have a really great plan moving forward to integrate this in the state and um, 
yeah, we're just really appreciative of you being here. And Sean, if you have anything to add about your program or anything um, that you've seen. I, I know that there's a lot of different folks, some that are from the human service centers, but then I know we also have different um, stakeholders on here as well. So um, yes, please refer to the program. If there's any questions, I'll put my um, information in the chat as well. Um, but I, I found this interesting. So I had a coworker who was messaging me and she says, don't you as a therapist get this training in school? And sadly, no, we don't get this amount of um, specificity when it comes to psychosis. We get a lot more related to, um, you know, how it relates to different diagnostics. But I think that's one of the things I've appreciated is just being able to kind of broaden the perspective of what psychosis is, how it could be associated with various things. Um, and so I, I found that to be very helpful as well. There's some good questions in the chat, so I'll let yeah. you guys get to that. I love that point you're making though, Shauna, that um, right now in general, our graduate programs, regardless of the training model, psychology, social work, MFT, et cetera, do not really teach folks about psychosis. And if they do, I think for most of these graduate programs, it's a little outdated. It's the old school idea that schizophrenia is untreatable, that, they, that folks with schizophrenia can't engage in talk therapy, that they are you know, gonna have chronic illness for the rest of their lives and can't engage in the community. And, and often it's sort of avoided as a topic in these grad schools. Um, and I think there's a couple different reasons for that, right? That I think, um, you know, folks who are going in and doing the teaching in these grad schools were taught in those grad schools. And so they might have limited understanding as a consequence of their own training. Um, and also just getting the word out about our new understanding of psychosis and the continuum and the ability for recovery. It's just taking time. Um, but what we've seen, you know, the, sort of there's hope here, both what we're seeing here on this phone call and the commitment that North Dakota has to this and across the country is a sweeping movement to implementing early psychosis programs using some version of the coordinated specialty care model. And so hopefully this is going to prompt changes in training because the workforce are going to need the skills to go into the work that is available to them. I know that in the state of California, we are committed to trying to shift this um, issue in our graduate programs. And we're having discussions with those appropriate community partners to try to increase that training. Um, and so I think if there's any opportunity for advocacy in your own communities around those programs, I would jump on it because otherwise, you know, folks are graduating with their programs, they're coming into the community and they don't necessarily have the skill um, to work in the work that they're doing, um, which just makes this hard. Uh, okay, so we have a couple good questions in the chat. Rick has asked, what would you think is the single most important intervention or management tool in assisting those with psychosis to remain successful in the community? What a great question, Rick. I think I would go with two things. Um, uh, well, I'm gonna say three. First, early identification. So if we can do screening in the community and get these folks to the right place as fast as possible, that is going to support them in remaining successful in their community. We want to catch them before things get too bad. And then second, psychoed. How do we normalize this experience for people? How do we reduce stigma? How do we get the family on board so that everybody understands what's happening? Um, we can label things. What is the word for this experience I'm happening? I'm having? What is the name for it? How do I communicate about it? Why is it happening to me? I think providing psychoed can really support people in um, understanding what's going on, in feeling validated, in normalizing their experience. They're not alone. There's lots of other people um, in the world who are experiencing similar things. And then the third thing I think is really important is going to be that case management, particularly from folks with lived experience. So going out into the community with a peer case manager, getting help, doing things like filling out forms to get your Medicaid, uh, filling out forms to get SS, uh, Social Security disability support, um, figuring out your bus route to school and like practicing taking that bus route, just providing that um, support and that um, scaffolding for navigating complex systems can really support an individual in 
staying successful in their community, in re-entering their community, and moving along in their in their recovery journey. I think if if those are the only things you can do based on your resources available to you, those are the things I would focus on. And at every step of the way, involving the family. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Um, in an ideal world, right, everybody goes into a coordinated specialty care program within like a month of being identified as having psychotic-like symptoms. In the absence of that ideal, I think those are the three things I would want you to do. Um, okay, Brady has a question, comment in the chat. Um, let me just double check. Thanks, thank you for a good job. Thank you so much, Brady, appreciate, appreciate the feedback. Um, I work for the F5 project as a care coordinator peer support specialist. I found this very beneficial as it educated me and gave me a bit of a better idea of what to do and what not to do. Hey, Brady, thank you so much for uh, bringing your lived experience. I think it is so valuable um, you know, to be able to talk from the perspective of understanding what it means to navigate the mental health system or other health systems, right? It's so validating. Um, so, you know, thank you for being a part of this community. Um, Dr. Tully, Danny Kraft has a question. She has her hand raised. Oh, hello, Danny. Hello, I'm sorry. I was just trying to be very patient because I know there were some other questions, but I just wanted to ask something. So I'm a case manager here at Southeast. And one of the things that I, as a case manager, of course, that, that connection piece is a big part of what we do. And what I'm trying to figure out and what we're trying to do is build collaborative partnerships with different agencies here in Fargo specifically. So are there any tips and tricks, you know, anything that you found, you know, that's helpful in your clinic practice or anything you'd like to pass along in that aspect? Yeah. Hey, what a good question, Danny. And, and thank you for um, your commitment to this work. It's it's so important. I think there's a couple different things um, uh, that are that are helpful here. The first one is that for lots of agencies, there are training needs, right? It might be part of their contract or scope of work from their funders. You know, sometimes this, the block grant money from SAMHSA requires regular training, et cetera. Um, and so can your program go out to those community agencies and provide training on what psychosis is, on how to screen for psychosis, on um, how do you do the referral process to your program? So giving that agency something that they need that is also going to help that two-way relationship. And I think even before you do that, setting up these me meetings with the folks in that agency and saying, what are you seeing? What's the challenges that you're having? And ca how can our two programs work together to meet those challenges? Because the truth of the matter is, is that these young folks are in those agencies and they're either not being identified because uh, those agencies don't have the tools or the resources to do that, um, or they are being identified, but then they don't really know what to do with them. And that's hard. That's a, a big struggle. So having that conversation, providing that education, providing that training, I think are really good ways of doing that. Um, we've done that with our local schools as well as other community mental health agencies. Um, and now we're doing it with our local juvenile justice system as well. Um, and it's just a lot of talking and meetings and and like, what are your needs and how do we work together? Um, and most of the time it's successful. It, That's very it's helpful. Like you're doing that. And yeah. With your meetings that you have that you talked about, your weekly meetings, do you include some of those agency partners or is that just strictly within your own clinic? That is strictly within our own clinic. Um, any meetings that we have with agency partners, typically that idea will come up in the weekly team meeting and then the core clinical team for that client will have a separate meeting with those agencies. So um, we out here in California, we have something called therapeutic behavioral services, which is like an add on kind of skills coaching that can be assigned to clients who are either at risk for hospitalization, have a recent suicide attempt or have a CPS, a child protective services um, case open. And so often we'll need to coordinate with those folks in treatment, but those folks won't necessarily attend our team meeting, mostly for confidentiality reasons, because in that meeting we're talking about all of our clients. Um, so, yeah, but certainly having other case management meetings with those agencies and doing that kind of um, collaboration. And that's mostly being driven by the primary clinician and the case manager. Yeah. Yeah, I'm typically a part of a lot of those meetings getting set up when people are coming in 
So I'm very familiar with that, but I just kind of wanted to see how you did it in your particular clinic, if it was all inclusive or just specific to the clinical team in your yeah, setting. specific to the clinical team. Absolutely. And we don't have the clients in that weekly team meeting either. Right. Um, it's discussing the whole clinic, but we do have um, clinical team client and family meetings as needed, right? Where you'll have everybody in the room, the physician, the clinician, the case manager, et cetera, and the client and family and have a sort of family team meeting about how things are going. So those those things are not precluded in the model. I see. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Danny. What a good question. Um, I see Lisa has a question in the chat. I'm wondering what a misdiagnosis or alternate diagnosis might look like early on, especially for young people. That's a really good question, Lisa. I think there's a broad range of diagnoses that we tend to see. Um, we tend to see um, early on, we might see things like ADHD as a reflection of the attention and learning and memory problems that people tend to have um, that are, uh, can appear before the onset of psychotic symptoms. Um, we also tend to see like anxiety, depression, mood disorders, um, and a sort of uh, minimization of the psychotic like symptoms because um, some providers may with younger folks may just say, oh, this is not real or, uh, you know, I don't believe that you ha you're having this experience or they might not even ask about it. Um, and then another big one that we tend to see is um, PTSD in the absence of comorbid psychosis. So we know that uh, trauma-related disorders and psychosis are, are highly comorbid, anywhere up to like 45% of our folks with first episode psychosis also meet criteria for PTSD. But often what's happening out in the field is that folks are just saying, oh, those hallucinatory experiences are flashbacks and they fit into PTSD. And so they're not diagnosing the psychosis. But then there's not a lot of movement in the treatment if you're not treating the hallucinations as hallucinations. And there are ways to distinguish those things. So, you know, a flashback is very specific, um, happens in specific environments as a consequence of a trigger, uh, doesn't always include sensory experiences, but can. And then we would start calling it a hallucination um, if it's happening outside of those specific contexts and the content of the hallucination is broader than the content of the traumatic event. And it's actually very common for folks to have um, uh, comorbid auditory hallucinations, for example, that have that sort of negative cognitive content that we see in PTSD, but are not part of the flashbacks. And so I think that's a common missed moment where folks are just given the PTSD diagnosis. To be fair, I would argue that in the psychosis field, we've also missed a lot of PTSD, but not because we're sort of misdiagnosing it, but because historically we weren't very good about asking about it. We're getting better, um, but certainly it was something that um, our sort of more traditional schizophrenia researchers and clinicians um, were not talking about. So I think, yeah, ADHD, probably the most common, depression and anxiety, secondary um, and then this kind of missing of a comorbid PTSD and, and psychosis, yeah. Um, plus the depression anxiety piece, can the anxiety might account for suspiciousness and paranoia, or it might look like social anxiety, and then we don't ask about suspiciousness and why we're anxious about social situations. And then depression is often given as a reflection of those negative symptoms, right? Reduction in activity, abolition, anhedonia, and so a real uh, detailed diagnostic evaluation is needed to tease those apart. I'm going to okay. scroll up, just make sure we miss any other questions. I just wanted to make everyone aware that we have contracted with Dr. Tully to do additional trainings. So we do not have those scheduled yet, but they will be coming probably in the next year. So um, look for the email invites that have been going out. We do a lot of marketing with these, um, which is probably why we resulted in so many attendees, which is great. So there will be additional trainings and they will also be uploaded to the website. So um, just for future reference. Yeah, um, we're gonna do some, some work on kind of treatment approaches, some CBT for psychosis pieces. I think it'll be um, really interesting. So stay tuned. Ah, uh, another question from Danny. Do you have buy-in or supports through medical providers in your area? At times, this has been difficult for medical providers to be on board with behavioral health treatment recommendations. That's such an interesting question. Um, I think it varies by the health system that we're working in. Um, 
and then it would also vary by the relationship that our physicians have with those um, other medical providers. Um, in general, um, when somebody is receiving care in our system, uh, primary care providers and other medical providers are not engaging in prescribing um, for mental health conditions. Uh, and that's, you know, somewhat of an ethical consideration um, and would require some discussion around transfer of care. I would say in general that we're getting referrals from those folks. Um, uh, I think, you know, our local primary care physicians are pretty good at recognizing when they, um, when prescribing things like antipsychotics might be out of scope. Um, and connecting with our department and our, our specialties. Um, but if you're if there's um, difficulty there, again, Danny, I would go back to this suggestion of doing trainings. I would I would probably hypothesize that that difficulty is associated with um, a lack of familiarity with what this might look like in young people. Um, you know, something that uh, uh, is really common, and actually I, I'm recalling a specific example of this during my own training, um, is that if the person doesn't present in the way that we think people with psychosis presents, regardless of the experiences they report, a, a person unfamiliar with psychosis will just be like, no, it can't be psychosis. So, for example, I was working with a 14 year old um, woman who had pretty severe, pretty frequent auditory hallucinations um, that were telling her some pretty nasty stuff. And uh, she had pretty intense paranoia around um, people trying to hurt and kill her out, outside of traumatic history. But she also presented, you know, well, she had her nails were always done, done up really well. She, she loved to express her personality through fashion, through her clothing, um, through makeup. She was social. She had a good social group um, and was had, had developed ways to manage her symptoms so that she could sort of pass in the general community. And it wasn't until that passing became really, really hard and she struggled at school that she came to our program. And I remember having a conversation with a physician who said it can't be schizophrenia because she's showered and clean. And I remember having to say that is not like look at the diagnostic criteria she is reporting these symptoms they are clearly impacting her functioning and it is not required that she present in a disheveled un unhygienic unshowered way for her to meet this diagnosis and it was quite a tense conversation because this individual had been trained um, many moons before I was trained and this was a common idea around schizophrenia that it was you know this is a disheveled person who can't take care of their daily living skills who's you know going to be homeless who can't engage in society and because this woman presented um so well it this the logic here for this man was it can't be schizophrenia but when you do the differential diagnostic interview it's clear so i think um coming back to that education coming back to going into your community and providing them with the knowledge so that you can reduce that stigma and increase that early identification. Dr. Tully, I'd also just like to, um, to add that the outreach and engagement um, consultant that we have hired will be doing that, um, that type of outreach, in, especially in the Bismarck and Fargo communities with the hospitals, emergency departments, crisis services and different um, universities and high schools. So I feel like the education piece will be expanding greatly within the next 12 to 18 months. So Danny, if you have, um, you know, specific agencies that um, in the Bismarck area that you would like this person to meet, um, we definitely can work with that, talk with Ariana, and we can, um, you know, definitely get something set up. But I do feel like we're going to be able to provide that um, moving forward from now. Yeah, that's great news. Yeah, I think it's so important um, because how else are we going to get these young folks to our programs, right? We have, they're, they're, like you say, they're turning up in schools, they're turning up at the emergency room, they're turning up at mental health urgent crisis centers. Those are the places that need the support and resources for screening and referral. Yeah. yeah. Good questions. Any other final thoughts? giving people time to type. <laughs>
um, the website is located that. Oh, gosh, I'm looking for the the CEU form. The CEU form is in the chat. So if anybody has difficulty with that, reach out to me. Yeah, get your CEUs. Yep. Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate it. Thanks, Bruce. I'm glad you were here. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Gosh, that's a real compliment to see so many people. I appreciate it. I know time is tight. I know you're busy. I know you're doing really valuable work in your communities. So thanks for spending your time with me. I hope it was useful. Thank you so much, Dr. Tully. We, we are very excited that you're willing to help us build this program in North Dakota. Oh, it's, it's such, yeah, it's close to my heart. You know, I have a, a family member with a diagnosis of schizophrenia and it's why I do the work that I do. And um, the more programs like this we can get out there and the earlier folks can get into treatment, the better. I don't ever want a family to experience what our family experienced, which is it just took too long for him to get the support that he needed. So thank you. Thanks for your commitment to this. It's great. It's really great to hear. <laughs>